So I've been at Evernote for a year. I was hired to do Sketch Touch, and we were brought in um, uh, to the Microsoft Early Development Program. So we've actually been running Windows 8 on my personal machine for, uh, for a year. Last February is when I started. Um, so I've been through all the developer preview, all the API changes, sort of all of the muddy water, um, and come out clean on the other side. And uh, there's lots of awesome stuff about Windows 8. There's lots of awesome tutorials and getting started type things. Uh, so the purpose of this talk um, is not to tell you how to, how to make a beginner's app uh, in Windows 8. There's much better stuff you know, that you can find online than what I'll give you. What, what, what I'm hoping to sort of do with this talk is sort of tell you some of the things that you're not going to see in those tutorials, like from you know, the real world, um, sort of some of the stuff that you're going to experience, some of the stuff you're going to need to know to actually make an app that's worth using in the Windows Store. Um, and if you love JavaScript like I do, it is a really awesome environment to write code in, because this is really what I consider the first sort of full-featured uh, environment where you can, you can do almost anything you know, your heart desires in JavaScript. So um, uh, I did not know anything about Windows 8 um, prior to joining Evernote. I had installed it and kind of messed around with it, um, but I hadn't really uh, you know, done a lot of Windows development. I'm not, uh, I'm not an old school Windows person. Um, uh, you know, I did the web stuff, I did the ASP.NET, MVC you know, at, at various jobs, but I have a background in PHP. But, but my personal passion is web development. My personal passion is JavaScript. Um, and so you don't have to be a Windows person to do this stuff. Um, and that was the whole reason they did that, was to bring in, I think, people with my background. Um, so let's get started. Uh, well, before we get started, the last little bullet point there, dev.windows.com. That is sort of the starting point. Um, awesome resource. Tons of good stuff on there. Um, that's where you go uh, when you get stuck. OK, so when your apps uh, are running on Windows 8, they're officially called Windows Store apps, to my knowledge. Um, <clears throat> and so your Windows Store apps obviously can be written in lots of different languages. Um, and the way that they'll be sort of uh, executed by you know, the, the Windows operating system is different for every language that you write it in. JavaScript specifically, you're just running an IE 10. Um, the, you know, sort of the bootstrapping process, the app launching experience is kind of handled by the operating system. You'll just get hooks into your app, you know, sort of like different events that your app is being launched and shut down and suspended. But, but mentally, uh, you could just think that you're writing an IE10. It is literally the IE10 um, rendering engine. And you're probably, you know, thinking if you're, if you're not like a Microsoft person, like crap, IE, you know, this is going to be a nightmare. Not, not IE10. So IE10 is standards friendly, very awesome. Um, if you haven't tried it out, you should go to this ietestdrive.com. You'll, you'll probably be impressed by what you find there. Really cool stuff. Um, but it's IE 10 plus a little bit. So, so you're going to have access to some, some extra host objects, right? JavaScript, the language itself, the ECMAScript spec, you know, specifies certain what they call built-in objects. You know, those are like your, your array constructor, your function constructor, you know, your regex constructor. And then the environment that your JavaScript code is dropped into will provide what are called host objects. So most people have mainly written browser apps, so that's window, that's document. Those are like the globals provided by the browser, and those are all there. But then you'll find extra host objects in IE10, and those, um, those will be sort of the native operating system hooks and, and the native APIs that you wouldn't normally get in a browser. So um, most of those will be found under a, a global called Windows with a capital W, and we'll get into that. But the, the Windows uh, global variable that's going to show up in your app um, will have a, a large hierarchy of, of object space that will give you access to all the device hardware, the sensors, the navigation, all that kind of stuff. Um, and the second point to make is that your app can now run in multiple contexts. So you're running in the browser, but you have access to stuff the browser normally wouldn't, like the user's sort of personal data, the file system, some of the hardware details. And so your app can run in what's called the local context, or it can run in what's called the, um, the web context. And there may be other sort of caveats with those two contexts, but they have sort of different purposes. Uh, so stuff you can't normally do on the web, for example, uh, like cross-domain uh, cross AJAX requests, right? Like without the support for cores and that kind of thing. Uh, you can when you're running in what's called the local context. So your app, you know, 
you can just make an AJAX request to google.com from your app and you're not going to get blocked, you're not going to get kicked by the OS because you're running like a native app. So um, you get extra goodies like that kind of thing. Um, but you can also specify that certain uh, chunks of your code will, will run in what's called the web context and then you'll get, uh, you'll get it just like you're in a browser and it's like uh, you know, your, your cross-domain AJAX request will be blocked and so you might say, well, why would I ever opt to run in a web context um, you know, whenever, my, whenever my, uh, my local context gives me more options? Well, in the local context, you do have some restrictions. For example, you can't dynamically inject script tags into your DOM. Um, and, and there's sort of all these uh, underlying security reasons for, for why, you, why Microsoft may or may not allow you to do certain things. It, it's all in the interest of protecting the user. Um, but but uh, just know that your app may run in two different contexts. <clears throat> so, um, so this thing called the Windows runtime, uh, what is it? So for a long time, Microsoft, um, you know, had a, had a native API called Win32. You may or may not know what that is. But that was sort of the native uh, API for dealing with Windows-specific operating system stuff. And then came along .NET, uh, which was an entirely new API, but it was a, uh, it was a managed code API, right? So your .NET code, um, you know, would run sort of through this intermediate sort of jitted, uh, you know, um, compiled thing on a dynamic layer called the CLR. If you don't know what any of this stuff means, it doesn't matter. But the bottom line is, there's now a new thing called the Windows Runtime. This is a new native API. This is not a managed code API. And the, the cool thing about this one is that these are JavaScript objects in your application. So this is the Windows operating system. This is the real deal, the whole, uh, you know, the whole kit and caboodle with some restrictions. But like this is um, lots of really cool APIs. And, and generally, um, you can just think that it's everything in the Windows namespace. So it's Windows dot whatever in your JavaScript app. That's going to give you access to lots of cool stuff. <clears throat> okay, second point. The Windows runtime, uh, which by the way they also uh, call WinRT. So if you've heard that term sort of floating around, the WinRT is, the, is this Windows runtime <laughs> API. Um, okay, async. <clears throat> so almost every... Uh, almost every method that does something significant that could potentially take, I think they've said 50 milliseconds, um, is only exposed as an async method. So very similar to Node.js in that respect, although it uses a different style than Node.js. So uh, um, what is async? Um, is it, I mean, every, everybody may be very, you know, uh, differing sort of skill level in here, but is everybody familiar with async style programming? Raise your hand. Yeah? Nay? Okay, so, um, so in Node.js, for example, when you write some async code, you know, you, you, you know, you call a method and then you pass in some arguments and you pass in a callback and then your callback gets executed whenever the method is done. All of the async in your JavaScript apps in the Windows Store um, will be done using a promise style async stuff. And so I'll, I'll pull up my... Um, I'll pull up my IDE and we'll walk through a little example there, but um, it's a different style of async programming, and so if you want to do it, um, if you want to do this uh, Windows Store thing, you better learn it. <clears throat> and we'll go through some examples. Um, okay, and then just in general, you know, the whole purpose of this Windows runtime, these are the extra host objects that let you, you know, uh, talk to the operating system. Okay, so then there's this secondary thing provided to your app called WinJS. Um, so WinJS are, are uh, it's like a, a general purpose front end framework um, that Microsoft has provided. And so this is not really OS specific stuff, but these sort of package components, it's just like any of the front end frameworks out there. This one specifically will make it look like Windows 8. So, you know, this kind of thing, you know, your, uh, these grids and these animations and all the tile look and feel, so all that kind of thing. Um, it just kind of comes out of the box with the WinJS style thing. So if you're looking to make a Windows 8 app without a lot of effort, it might be a good idea to use the WinJS uh, components. <clears throat> a, couple of, a couple of points about these. Most of them are actually reusable in just a normal browser, right? So if you want to just write a generic web app, which is sort of, um, you know, the, 
you know, a big advantage of writing these native apps in JavaScript because, you know, in theory, they should be translatable to a browser and you should be able to make both sort of a, a native and a, um, and a web version of your apps using the same code base, which is, you know, sort of what we're doing at Evernote. <coughs> and, um, and, and there may be some anomalies and some, you know, um, some tricks to, to getting that to work right, but in general, you can think of this as just a pure front end um, framework. Uh, what else comes out of here? So, uh, another thing really cool that Microsoft has done with, with the framework that um, you may not have had to think about before is that they've sort of unified uh, different styles of pointer events. Like this machine that I'm on now, this is, a, uh, this is a touch screen laptop, right? So I got my finger on the screen here. So, you know, when you're writing web apps, you're generally not thinking that somebody's going to you know, both touch the keyboard and the screen at the same time, or you, you don't have to think about, you know, handling like a stylus and a mouse click at the same time, or, or things that like haven't really come up in traditional web development, but right, lots of these machines are hitting the market, and Microsoft has something called like uh, MS Pointer uh, categories of events, so they sort of uh, unify all the pointer hardware in sort of one event structure, so you'll get an event like, you know, MS Pointer down, MS pointer up kind of thing, um, you know, while your, you know, while your code is running, and that could mean a stylus, that could mean a finger, that could mean a mouse click, or whatever. So um, you don't really have to think about that cool stuff. <clears throat> okay. Um, so now let's get into sort of what, what's going to happen while you're writing these apps. So the first thing that's going to confuse you, um, or it confused me, was the navigation model. So the way you write these apps, um, and I'm not going to like sort of do too much live coding here, but let's, let's give it a shot. So if I open up Visual Studio, I don't know how easy that's going to be to see, but I'll, I'll zoom in when it's appropriate. So I'm just going to come out of the box. Uh, this is the free Visual Studio Express. I'm just going to make uh, one of the pre-provided template apps from Microsoft. So if you just come in here and say new project, there's a templates, JavaScript, Windows Store style apps. I'm just going to hit something called the Grid app. <clears throat> and it just gives you like a, a little CSS, I don't know if you could see it, CSS images and JS folders on the right. And then there's a folder over here called Pages. And um, it's just folders containing HTML, CSS, and JavaScript files. Really indistinguishable from just a normal web app. Um, and over here, here's kind of like the bootstrapping um, uh, default.js that it sort of generates for you. Don't worry about all the details of all this. Um, that's not the point of the talk. <clears throat> it's that uh, when you run this thing, it's just running in the browser. You're going to be able to sort of inspect the DOM as you run this guy. And, um, and at some point in your app, you're going to sort of want to navigate between two of your HTML pages. And in a browser, so what does a browser do when you navigate between two pages, you know, in the traditional sense, right? The whole browser sort of tears down the whole in-memory DOM and everything and sort of, you know, brings in new HTML, new JavaScript, uh, clears out your global context and sort of reconstructs the whole environment with every page refresh, right? Um, in this guy, that doesn't happen. So, so this is just the default app. I haven't done a single thing. This is just the grid template. Um, and, you know, it kind of looks like the Windows Start screen or whatever. So this is running in the grid. But this is just the HTML page uh, that's defined back in Visual Studio here. So if we come back here and, and look at uh, um, the default.html, um, you see that it's including, you know, some scripts. It's including some CSS. looks just like a web page. Um, and then it navigates to, like, a grouped uh, a group page. Um, what? Let me, sorry. Let me get back to the app. So, like, you see these groups. This is just how they do the app. But, like, if I click on, like, group uh, title 2, it goes to this HTML page. So, what, so group detail would be this HTML page here. So, what I just want to show you, without digging through all the HTML here, is that there's two HTML page the pages defined in the product, project. And both of them, if you look sort of at the top of them, they're both full 
HTML pages. This is, has a doc type, has an HTML, a head tag, a body tag. And uh, when I navigate to the next one, it has an HTML, a head tag, and a body tag. And so you as the developer, your natural instinct is going to tell you that sort of it will clear out one of those you know, HTML pages and it will bring in the next one. When in reality, that's not what it's doing at all. The first HTML page that gets loaded into your app sort of stays there forever. And then there's navigation code that's written in JavaScript by the Microsoft libraries. So when I navigated to that group page, what it was actually doing is it goes in this group detail page and it looks at the inner HTML of that head element and it will look for sort of the diffs between that inner HTML and the existing head element on the page and it will attempt to merge any missing script elements into the page and any style sheet elements into the page. Not obvious to you at all, um, but it does have some maybe unintended consequences. So this is sort of the in the trenches part, right? So like let's say you have a JavaScript file and, and during the parsing of that JavaScript file, let's say you have like a, a console.log statement or something like that. That JavaScript file is only going to be parsed one time. So if you navigate to that page the first time, that console.log statement will be executed. But now that that file has been parsed, if you navigate away and then navigate back, it's not going to reparse your JavaScript file, right? So, so just be cognizant of the fact that your, your JavaScript files that you include on an HTML page are actually only being parsed one time. Obviously, you can call the methods and stuff that you provide on them more than one time, but, um, but it's going to behave differently than a web page, whereas if you navigate to a page every time, the JavaScript gets parsed every time, right? So it's tricky. So that's what it does with the head element and sort of has those sort of weird, you know, um, weird side effects. With the body element, it does something very similar. Um, I won't go into all the detail of how it works, but you could sort of imagine it taking sort of the body element, inner HTML, and sort of removing that from the DOM and then looking at the inner HTML of the, the page you're navigating to and then injecting that. So um, if you're not careful, you could sort of leave, leave a trail behind. Um, if, you, if you're starting to put markup in weird places or you're, you're um, um, assuming elements are going to be um, left in place inside your, your, your body element when they're not, uh, the bottom line is um, assume that once your app is launched, that DOM is in memory for the entirety of your app. It's never going to go away. It's only going to be manipulated from that point forward. So <coughs> uh, let's go back to PowerPoint. <laughs> okay. Um, and just the first bullet point in orange up there. Um, your pages are not served through the HTTP protocol. Because the way the apps work, right, is the user downloads an app from the store. All the markup and resources, everything is locally packaged on their disk. Whenever they navigate, quote unquote, to the first page, it's not, uh, it's not requesting you know, those bits through HTTP. It's requesting it through a Microsoft protocol called ms-appx. So if you actually like, did like a window.location inside your app, you're going you're gonna to see the scheme you know, or the protocol on the location as ms-appx. And it's that exact thing that puts you in the local context, like I was talking about earlier. Now, if you load something in an iframe, an iframe, you know, you could load google.com in an iframe. Obviously, that will be loaded with HTTP. And so you can see how you could quickly get in a situation where you have you know, different frames running in different contexts sort of within the same app window. Um, and you could, even load, you could even load your own code in an iframe through the local context or through the web context, depending on if you address it, like the iframe source as HTTP or MS AppX. So you sort of have control over what you want to load in which context, um, but be aware that everything is not HTTP. And that we could do a whole talk on sort of the differences between those, but I'm, you know, we don't have that kind of time. <clears throat> Okay, so promises. Let's do a time check. <laughs> okay, so what are promises? Um, <laughs> promises uh, are really, really, 
a cool thing. But there's something that you really need to buy into uh, to really feel the power and the advantage of programming in this style. So I'm not going to give a whole sort of like, you know, sample project with lots of promises, but I'm going to write up a little bit of code just to demo sort of what, what's going on with these guys, right? And so the purpose of uh, promises, and why are they called promises? Well, that's typically like what the name of the object is because it represents um, the promise of an async method to eventually finish. Um, or a method, which, you know, in theory doesn't have to be async, but, you know, in general, this stuff is used with async methods. And the way that you'll see them sort of um, manifest in your Windows 8 app, inside that Windows namespace, you're going to see lots and lots of methods that end with this async, this capital A async. So it might be like create file async. Whenever you see something end in the word async, one of the methods, that means it's going to return a promise, which means that if you want to wait until that method is done, you have to use the promise style of waiting. So what is the promise style of waiting? Let's go back to our app. Um, OK, so here's this default.js. In this, in this file, um, I know because I've done this a million times, but like when you bring up that template file, this is just sort of the bootstrap code that handles the launching of your app. So you don't need to know for purposes of this talk, like every detail in here. But all you do need to know is that your app is listening for an event called activated, which will be raised by the Windows runtime. That means your app has been brought to the foreground, right? And, and it can be brought to the foreground in more than one way. Like somebody could share to your app, somebody could resume it or whatever, but let's just assume that it's being launched. So when your app is launched, I know whatever I put here, this is sort of if the activation, if the activation kind is launched, um, I know this code is going to run. So when I launch the app, whatever I put here is going to get run. So in Visual Studio, you'll get some, you get some IntelliSense, which is helpful. So I'm going to type Windows, and you'll see that namespace there. Then I get lots of stuff. Um, so one of the namespaces is called storage, and this is sort of like file writing, you know, all the file system stuff. So there's a storage API, and um, it has an object called application data, which represents the current user's application data. Um, it's kind of like, uh, like a static class, so it has this current method. So this is like the current user or current property. This is like the current user's application data. And then it'll have something on here called local folder. And if you see uh, its description of this property is it gets the local, it gets the root folder in the local app data store. So somewhere on the disk, right, whenever a user installs an app, you're allocated a little directory structure on the user's disk for their local data folder. So this is their local data folder. It represents a folder object. Okay, now this, this has a lot of methods on it, and most of them are async. If you can even see in the IntelliSense there, you'll see a lot of async. I'm just going to pick one uh, called create file async. And so that's what the methods will look like. They'll end in this async word, and then they'll take, you know, different arguments. So this one is just saying pass in a string, that's the name. I'll just say like file1.txt, just like an empty text file. Okay, so, so what did I just do there? Um, I just created a file. But it's an async method because all the, all the file I.O. stuff could potentially take longer than 50 seconds, so they wanted to make it async. So if I write a line of code, and actually, since I had to zoom in so much, I'm just going to do this. I'm just going to make a little var here, and I'm just going to say local folder. So I don't have to type out that whole Windows namespace. So let's say the, the local folder is this guy. OK. So, so if I put a line of code right here, you know, like console.log, is it done? So the answer is no, right? And it's guaranteed to be no because all this create file async did was it kicked off this file creation you know, code. And the, and the natural way JavaScript works is it's going to sort of loop through all of your code line by line until it has no more events to process. And then we'll say, like, the JavaScript event loop makes a turn, and then it's going to listen for more events. And when it finally listens to the event that says, 
the file creation is done, then you're going to get a callback on create file async. And so the way you do this in Windows 8 is you say create file async dot then, and then you give it your callback. And you just pass in a function here. And there you have it. Now, in your callback, inside this then method, the return value is going to appear here. So this is going to be file one here. And so if this style is not familiar to you, um, then you're going to need to get familiar with it because this is the whole Windows 8 programming experience in JavaScript. Lots and lots of this kind of stuff. So I say, go do this async thing. Then when you're done, I pass in you know, an anonymous function. You could pass in a reference to a function somewhere else. And then uh, the return value from the async operation comes in as an argument of the function. So what happens? So you quickly can imagine that this can get tricky after a while, right? Go, we can ask questions. Go ahead. It's, it's the object that, that, uh, that represents the, the physical file on disk, right? And it's not going to exist. Right. 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 So it's like this. Yeah, it's like this, right? This is what's really happening. When you call create file async, you get this promise object. The promise has, a, has an API, has a method called then, right? And whatever you give to the then method is not going to be invoked until the file is actually done being created on disk, right? And so every time I call create file async, I'll get a new promise. So I could do it for file two, file three, and file four. Go ahead. So it seems like the uh, callback functions are going to have all sorts of different um, uh, methods and features. Is there any reason to tell for like create file async to get um, the callback function with um, what its callback parameters will be? There's some IntelliSense, but the documentation is excellent. You know, you go to the dev.windows.com, the API is super. Yeah, but I mean, it's very, very, like, not a big deal. I mean, I've been doing it for a year. Maybe, maybe it feels like a big deal. But this is generally, like, this is generally a prob problem in any sort of async programming, right? Um, it's tough, you know, because you actually have to execute the code to sort of know where the arguments are going. Well, you know, there, whenever I, whenever, if you saw whenever I started typing this guy out, right? So when I did, sorry, dot create file async. So the result of that yeah. Function. Yeah. You, you see this guy? You see this uh, storage file in, in sort of angle brackets there? It's hard to see, right? This I, async operation, I don't know if you could see that. That's the return value, right? There's never multiple arguments returned. Promise always returns a single argument. So valid question, right, of a single type. What's that? The promise, the promise is a single object. No, no, no. The, the promise, like a contract, states that you have a single, the return value is a single, uh, a single value. If you need to return more than one value, you just return an object, okay. right, with lots of values. So it's, always be one. Uh, it's always one argument. Yeah, type, yes, right. Right. It's like the common JS promises slash A spec. If you read it, it's very clearly laid out. It's a short spec, super short, right? It's like the contract states all, all promise callbacks need to return a single argument. Not the promise that's being returned, 
this stuff gets tricky to talk about in words. That's why I put it in the, you know, because you just start saying promise, promise, promise over and over. <laughs> but yeah, so if I say create file async, you'll get it there in those angle brackets, but I thought you were asking will you get it uh, after I write the dot then. You know, like when I'm down here and I write, fu you know, function open parens, you're not going to get the IntelliSense at that point in the IDE. You'll get it at the, at the point where you invoke the, you know, the async method. So you very quickly, you know, we don't have to go into too much detail, but you can, you can quickly sort of chain these guys, and this is the point, is you do this kind of thing with them. Um, and so let's say I wanted to create, you know, three files, but I wanted them to all be dependent on the creation of the previous one. The, you know, the style is inside the callback to your promise, you return another promise. So I can, I can just do it over and over again. Um, and if I do it this style, I don't, and I don't know, you know, you got to bend your mind a little bit, right? <laughs> but what's happening here, um, so why would I do it this way? Because now I know that file two will not even begin to be created until file one is done being created and so forth. So this sort of like uh, is a good way to, to chain asynchronous things uh, in a way that are v that's very deterministic. Um, but it can get confusing and it can, you know, be tricky when you're debugging. Um, so those are just the other, you know, the last point I want to hit is when you're debugging this thing, you got to put your breakpoints sort of inside the callback here. Um, you, you put it inside, you know, the code that's within your callback because you're going to jump sort of through this as you, you know, that's sort of like the progression of your code. Um, You'll get used to it when you start doing it, but if you haven't done this before, your natural instincts are probably not going to tell you to do it this way. Um, you'll get used to it. It's the same pattern over and over again, and you really got to think about it. But this is just uh, it's sort of, you know, will save you a lot of time if you just do it this way. <clears throat> okay. Uh, let's go PowerPoint. Oh, wrong view. Sorry, guys. Oh, <laughs> we're good. Let's go again. Okay. We're not good. I apologize. Okay, um, we can talk about those more at the end. Time check. Okay, we got ten minutes. Okay, uh, same code in the browser. So a lot of times, what you're going to want to do uh, is reuse the code you write because you're going to put a lot of cool stuff in here. Um, because the because the environment forces you to write in an async way, you're going to get a lot of natural advantages from that is you're going to be forced to write very responsive code whether you want to or not. You're not going to be able to block the UI for any reason. I mean, anything that I think Microsoft said will take potentially like in the 30 to 50 millisecond range is going to be forced to do, forced to be done async, so you will not be able to sort of freeze the user experience on the UI thread. Um, but then again, all these, a lot of these async APIs, they're not W3 standards. Um, and so what I would say is, Whenever there's a standards API that does the same thing as the Windows API, opt for the standards if you're planning on reusing this thing in a browser, obviously. Um, but be careful because some of the WinRT things are like faster, you know, because, you know, they're, they're on the platform and, and more tightly integrated. And, you know, you've got to kind of take those on a case-by-case -case basis. We found some interesting things with like the Canvas element. We do a lot of 2D graphics type stuff, things that could potentially be slow. Um, and so what we personally, you know, did at Evernote was we kind of just wrote like a thin, like abstraction layer, you know, that just sort of depending on either the build or uh, some runtime detection stuff says maybe we're going to opt for the standards or the Windows version of this API. But sort of the core logic of the code, uh, you know, is just expressed using like an intermediate sort of abstraction um, or sort of an intermediate like object that you would use that sort of either calls one or the other. Uh, other things that you're going to want to watch out for. You're going to do a lot of stuff with gestures in your Microsoft app, so 
you know, you get all the cool stuff, the pinch zoom, the swipe, you know, the, you know, inertia, you know, you kind of flick the thing and it kind of flies across the screen. Lots of cool gesture events. You'll get like gesture start, gesture manipulation events and pinch and all that kind of stuff. There are no W3 standards for gesture events yet. There is a, uh, the, act, the W3C has actually accepted the Microsoft uh, proposition, the MS pointer events that I talked about earlier has actually been uh, now formalized in the W3C. So the pointer events will be unified, but those are all for a, a single pointer. Um, anything that involves like, you know, five fingers on the screen, there's no W3C thing for that. So if you kind of app, if you write an app that sort of depends on a lot of that stuff, you know, be careful because that's a tough solution uh, right now in browser world. <clears throat> if somebody writes a library, you know, to handle gestures, <laughs> you know, that would be an awesome one to put on GitHub. I think some people are looking into it, but I haven't found anything that's good. Um, and then be careful with file system stuff. Um, it's kind of mixed support across browsers. There's actually multiple file APIs in the W3C. There's one for, you know, reading files, writing files, and then like accessing the file system and sort of the folder structure of the user. Not all three of those are implemented in any browser, to my knowledge, fully. Um, they're all kind of, you know, piecewise, you know, put together. So um, the same suggestion there. Um, you know, if you're writing code that you're going to use across different places, sort of make your own intermediate object to abstract that stuff. Um, and then this is, this is my last slide, and we can do questions. <coughs> uh, these are gotchas that I personally ran into. So your source code will be packaged into your app. Obviously, it's a JavaScript app. Your source code is not being compiled, you know. It's not like uh, you submit it to the store and then they, you know, build it into bytecode and deliver the bytecode to the client. Your source code is delivered to the client. So at a minimum, you want to at least obfuscate, minimize, you know, whatever, minify it. Um, you know, the, the directories that it's installed in are difficult to get to, and the person has to know what they're doing. But, you know, obviously, this is not, this is, this is just like a website. So don't put personal information in your source code in JavaScript. Um, quick caveat to that one. I didn't even go over this, but... Uh, there, there's so many things. It is possible in your JavaScript apps to call into native code. So if somebody writes like a library in C++, you can actually invoke those methods from your JavaScript code if it's, if it's packaged the right, the right way by the library builder. Something like that might be a good place to put sensitive information or something like that. That's one way around that. <clears throat> yeah. Right, it's a case by case. There's no like guaranteed, you know, thing, but uh, yeah, yeah. So you know, um, just be aware. These are things to be aware of. Localization. Um, a lot of web developers don't don't ever think about localization. Don't do multiple languages, but super good idea. Just from the very start, don't hard code any strings into your app. It's very simple to use the localization stuff in Windows 8. You just simply call a, uh, a, a method uh, that, that looks up something in a strings file that you just include with your app. So if you just do that sort of from day one, and you know, maybe you only have an English strings file for the lifetime of your app. If anybody ever wants to write another strings file, it just, it just all works. So think about that from day one, because um, that can be painful you know, when submitting to the store if you, if you want to submit in multiple languages. There's something called the WAC. Uh, it's, a, it's a Windows application certification kit. It's just an app. It's a thing you can run locally that will inspect all of your source code and make sure it's all ready to be packaged to be submitted to the store. If your app fails the WAC locally, it's going to fail the submission, so don't even waste your time. Know what it is when you're building these apps and run it through there. Little things like all your files, source code files must be you know, UTF. Eight encoded with the byte order mark at the beginning, things you normally don't think about probably. <laughs> and you'll get rejected from the store for little things like that. Um, follow the design guidelines. This has nothing to do with JavaScript, but like Microsoft has a very like extensive set of web pages that show you how you need to design your app, you know, where the buttons need to be, what they should look like, sort of how the animation should work. If you break the design guidelines, you will be rejected. Don't try and like bend the rules, you know, like you can't really put one past them. Um, and then no clever tricks. You know, since you can call into like native code from your JavaScript app, um, in theory you can do like kind of some crazy stuff there, right? Um, if you know what you're doing, you know, you can use the p invokes, you can do sort of stuff that, to call 
APIs that would normally be considered out of bounds or off limits by the, uh, by the app store. And so even though technically you can, you can accomplish something through your app, you know, since you now have access to the OS, um, even if you can do it, they'll detect it in the store submission process and you'll get bumped. So um, these are just things to save you time. These apps are super cool and um, I've, had a good, I've had a great time building it. Ours is called Sketch Touch. Go check it out. You can see the kind of cool stuff you, know, you can do with these apps. But um, we've got maybe a few minutes, I don't know. So that's all I got. Um, I don't think anybody's in the room after me, so we can keep talking if you want. Thank you very much. <laughs>